Hello and welcome to another episode of the Christian Reeve podcast. Today, my guest is a young YouTuber who originally hailed from the UK, but has now moved to the Netherlands. His name is Dutch Deals. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you, man. I'm doing great. How about you? Very good. Uh, I'm going to test a little experiment on you today. <laughs> go ahead let me be so um man. yeah no don't worry it's nothing crazy um so normally as i've kind of said in my previous podcast interviews i tend to do a ton of research before i come into these you know i just learn everything i can but i want to test two things a i want to see how much i actually know about you <laughs> already off the top of my head so I do have some questions. And B, I want to kind of see yeah, right, if I can do a podcast, you, you know, where it's um, more off the top of my head, kind of just see where it goes, um, less formulaic. I, I, I want to test this theory because I have some people that are interested in coming on the podcast who don't necessarily have like projects ongoing that they're pushing. You know, maybe they would just be interesting guests. So I want to kind of see if I can do it, if I can pull it off, if, uh, I just want to test myself. I want to see, you know, how versatile I am as a podcaster and interviewer and so on and so forth. So yeah, um, that's the deal. How do you feel about that? Uh, that sounds pretty good to me. I mean, I'm always open to experiments and me, myself, I've started, um, using different sort of tags in my videos and I've been hmm. putting more effort into my thumbnails rather than just a black screen and with some writing I've been actually taking photos and editing those and I found that that actually works better because it brings attention to the video mm. you know one rather than just a black screen one thing I did notice actually which is often the case with many beginnings of series videos is that your first vlog has the most views and then the rest are like gaining but like you know there i guess still developing yeah yeah right 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 but it always happens that way do you know what i mean like i've released series on my youtube before that you know it's always the case with the first episode bangs and then the rest of the episodes don't <laughs> but uh it is welcome it to is. youtube oh well yeah of course of course it's it's just never easy it's a slug it really is a slog a slog shall we say but um a slog a slog what would be the Dutch word for a slog? Um, schlog. <laughs> schlog. 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 Okay, teach us some Dutch words. Why not? Because this is a preview of your um, series that you're doing on YouTube right now, or you're beginning a series where you teach Dutch words. Yeah. So uh, teach us some Dutch words. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, what do you want to know? Because uh, <laughs> I, I, I get the question a lot. I mean, in 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 school, okay. there was a lot of people that just came up to me and said, um, "Speak some Dutch." Speak some Dutch. Which really doesn't help because what, what do you want me to say? Do you want me to tell you how to go away in Dutch or what? Um. <laughs> so, so what do you, what do you want to know? Oh, what would be something interesting? Um. Oh, I don't know. Uh, how about your mother is your sister? Your mother is your sis. <laughs> oh, it's just like German. <laughs> I'm so disappointed. It is. It's a bit like German. So. <laughs> oh, I knew, I knew it was. I said this to a friend of mine the other day because I'd mentioned you and how you'd moved over there, and I said that. Your mother is your sis. Yeah, I said the German is like a mixture of almost like English, German, uh, fucking Danish. Well, I was in Belgium today, mm. and uh, the Belgians speak Flemish, which is a myth. Oh. French. I, we just lost you there. Can you say that again? Uh, yeah, no problem. I said uh, I was in Belgium today, mm. and they speak uh, a language called Flemish, mm. uh, um, which is French and Dutch mixed. Okay. It sounds pretty weird. Yeah, I've heard of it, but that's pretty strange. And so Belgium, I guess, borders quite close to the Netherlands then, I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, where we live, um, 
we're right next to a landmark called the Drilanderpunt, okay. which is the... Th oh, we lost you again. Country's point, uh, if you were to translate it literally. We keep losing you, man. Um, I don't know what's going on there. Um... Yeah, it's a bit choppy uh, over here sometimes, but I guess we're just going to have to deal with it. Um, mm. Basically, the Drilanderpunt, or the Three Countries Point, which is how it's literally translated, is the meeting of Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium. So wow. it's where all three of those countries meet, and it's a big uh, tourist landmark. It's a pretty cool place, spot to be in, I suppose, <coughs> in terms of travel and, uh, you know, just generally being able to travel between those countries and gain a bit of culture and such. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite interesting because no matter what time of day it is, I mean, I guess early in the morning and late at night is pretty empty but during the day there's always people there hmm. okay. coming from all across the globe and i was sitting uh having my coffee uh at the table asked my uh where how, like if i like where i was from so i put in warner which is for mine is a I, I, like i'm a resident of actual place and uh yeah so i guess they're trying to name figure out who's from where what's going on hmm. what they can do to help that kind of thing Okay. Like it wasn't a survey as in like to figure out stuff, it was just to sort of see where people come from and where people are heading, that kind of thing. That's strange. I've never heard of that before. Who who gave you this survey? Uh the waitress at the uh the, the cafe that we uh sat at. She uh, handed us our coffees and she gave us this piece of paper and there was a little survey. That's so weird. <laughs> I'm not sure if they're doing that in other places or if it's just that place because they get a lot of uh, traffic, but yeah. I don't know. I, it's kind of clever. I want to delve into this a bit more and quiz you because I've never heard of this before. So instead of having like some sort of, I don't know, uh, customer service feedback form or some shit, it's literally just questions like, where are you from? What nationality are you? Do you live like, in a local town? Well, what other questions well, were on not, there? Not that, um, not that specific. Okay. It was... Uh, it asked for my name and first name. Right. It asked for telephone slash email address. Um, That's too much information. Where I was from. <laughs> uh, sort of like, are you a are you a resident or are you a traveller? Okay. Um, and it asked uh, like it wasn't stuff about the actual cafe itself. It was more about us. Right. There wasn't many questions. I think it was just those four. But yeah. Oh, okay. I suppose it's just a quick idea of you know. Regular. Yeah, like while you're having your coffee or your food, you can just quickly scribble that out and just sort of fill it. Right, for them. but like for them, I guess the objective is to establish like you know how many regulars versus how many uh, tourists, tourists they get, and yeah, and they can factor in. But they could probably actually fact uh, figure out how to do like ordering based on on the numbers and you know the amount of people they're getting from you know fruit as in tourists or locals and such. Maybe, I don't know. I'm just theorizing at this point. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't look too much into it at the time, but I mean, I guess it's pretty important to sort of see where your customers are from, what they're doing, where they're going, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just sort of paying attention to the littler things. Right, 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 right. Okay, so you've literally just moved to the Netherlands, and uh, f for those who don't know, did you, have you just turned 16, or are you about to turn 17? How old are you? Like when did you work? Uh, I turned sixteen in February. February. Okay. Oh, yeah. So you're fresh. Okay. So um, fresh. <laughs> fresh. Yeah. I don't know why I used the word fresh. Fresh. Off the streets. Fresh. <laughs> fresh off the streets. It's just a weird. I don't know why I said that. Like you know, like new, new. You've just turned. You know, you've just turned that age. Um, fresh into young adulthood. <laughs> you're not actually my youngest guest. My youngest guest so far was fifteen. So. Oh, I'm so, oh sugar. So I'm a little bit off. No. <laughs> I've had a range. I've had uh, like thirties, twenties, uh, yeah, teens. It's 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 all inclusive here. It's everyone. Um, Fair enough. It's it's pretty interesting actually. From in terms of having a, a variety of guests, and you do notice the um, differing kind of mindsets, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's the way I see it. But um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> um, 
Why was I asking you your age? What's what's the significance there? Right. So um, this is a big change for you uh, in terms of moving country to country. Uh, have you finished your GCSEs? Or what's the uh, yeah, I took. I, I didn't take my tests, but they're uh, they're just using expected grades. Oh rah. So I guess I'm getting off easy because I don't test well. Uh, I'm fair, fair enough in class, like writing a book in a room surrounded by people in a casual environment. Yeah. But when I'm sat in a hall with a piece of paper and absolute silence, mm. that sort of gets to me, I suppose. I think it gets to everyone, you know. I mean, I've, I remember when I was studying at uni and we would talk about this and I remember reading somewhere about best ways to study and all this shit and one of the people that i the the person who had this information that i was reading about i don't know where the source was from but it basically just said that like the reason that you know people often fail in tests is not even anything necessarily to do with the test itself but more the actual environment because you think if you're studying typically like you said you're in a comfortable spot maybe you're listening to music whatever but you're comfortable that's the key point whereas in the exam hall um you know you're in as you said like that dark maybe cold area you know a cold hard desk oh, it's freezing you know if anything i think the only way you can actually prepare for a test properly is to build yourself like an actual study room with the shitty like exam hall um <laughs> table and chair to so, like actually put yourself in that environment <laughs> maybe that's the best but that's way sort of, but that's sort of like torture to yourself because yeah. it, it pretty much in the exam hall that we use at our school mm. well at my old school it was pretty much you wear a jumper or you freeze to death in a white shirt Fuck. that's sort of yeah, you need a jumper. If you don't have a jumper, you, you, you there are. It's so cold. You're allowed to wear your coat if you ask. <laughs> See, I always had the uh, opposite problem. I was always boiling and just fucking. Yeah, just just really. I guess I was just um, uh, under pressure, so I was really tense and you know, just hot and bothered. I guess as a result, but. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I guess the point more that I was making was to kind of simulate the environment of um, what the test area will be like within your re revision center. And yeah, you do make a point. It is torturous. But then again, <laughs> exams are torturous. You know, they're not supposed to be enjoyable experiences. The whole system is flawed. Don't get me wrong. Like, I totally think that. Oh, but, very. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not even really necessarily about what you know it's like how much information can you regurgitate us in a specific period of time <laughs> you know what i mean but anyway i mean actually you no. Know, before i move on that i have actually met people at gcse in sixth form level many years ago who uh, actually had like fo like photographic memories where they remembered every single page of um the books we were given for the courses but uh they didn't actually learn the information they just memorized it so they didn't actually learn anything oh i mean that would be <laughs> handy in the sense that you could sort of be a robot in the sense that you know exactly how to fill it out yeah but that's sort of also flawed because that's not actually their knowledge that's just remembrance yeah but that's kind of my point in, in in general like okay that's an extreme example where someone's managed to like exploit the system and <laughs> win but at the same time like in general that's what everyone has to do you have to remember like it's not even <sighs> but they make it not fun they make it they yeah. make it so that you have to not that because you want to oh of course yeah none of this has to do with what you want <laughs> at all i mean ugh. I don't know, man. I've always thought the whole system is flawed, but um, I don't. It is flawed. I, I mean, it's pretty broken. I don't know what you could replace it with, though, because that would be a lot of people's first suggestions. Would be, well, okay, fine. If the system's flawed, what's your <laughs> Einstein? What's your uh, solution? And it's like, well, I would say coursework, but you know, that's also flawed in its own ways. Maybe I don't know more so or less so than exams. I would say. I think they should just ask teachers. They should. They should say, okay over the course of this term mm. how good do you think uh dylan has worked in your class how 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 much knowledge do you think he's retained how much do you think he would be able to do if he was an actual let's say geographic environment and then they would write out their form and then submit it to the exam board 
well, not exam board. It would be a um, like a, like a student work board or whatever it would be. And then they would sort of use that to help guide students into where they need to do better and where they need to sort of improve uh, without sort of focusing them in an environment where they don't feel comfortable and they don't feel happy because that's not what their workplace is going to be like. Because if you're working in, say, a garage or a forest, it's going to be comfortable because you're going to be with people that you know, you're going to be doing work that you know yourself not because you just remember it you know i reckon what would work would be if you would have like a cumulative testing experience <laughs> that was my dad's phone i didn't silence it god damn it <laughs> i was gonna yeah he has this he has this thing on his phone i think my stepmom does as well where it it flashes as well it, it flashes an led light so i just got blinded it's usually it's banged. usually when boomers have like uh breaking news bulletins so it's probably like bbc oh, news don't, don't call my dad a boomer he won't like that <laughs> he's 50. <laughs> oh he is a boomer then he is a boomer but he doesn't want to be called it because then he thinks of karen who oh like, you, know, you, know the, you know the karens the sort of um, yeah, but they have nothing to do with uh, generations that's any age person can be a karen true but it's it's normally the stereotypical middle-aged mother of three who is has a unhappy uh relationship with her husband who wants to speak to the manager if someone accidentally spills a coffee mm. i don't know man i just see it as totally different things like for me boomer is essentially just someone who you know is so incredibly out of touch that it doesn't even necessarily have to refer to their age do you know what i mean because i think you can be old and still be with it i think it's more about being so out of touch but sort of having a go at the younger generations and telling them how they should be running things when like society like in my day blah 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 right yeah but like more than that it's like they're faced with the technology that they don't understand and then they say, oh, well, you know, actually, we should be doing it this way. And it's like, well, time has passed you by. Do you know what I mean? It's like that shit doesn't work anymore. You know, like, to be honest, the, the whole boomer culture is it's just ignorance. It's just ignorance to the new world. And they don't know how to get in touch with it. So if you can't beat them, you beat them harder they, instead of joining them, you know. And I, my mother has asked me several times how to use her own telephone. And it's it's just Instead of like looking it up and learning mm. for herself, she expects me to know how just because I'm younger than her and I'm more in touch with technology. I mean, okay, I, ignorance. I agree with you, but at the same time, you would know. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, because you are, um, yeah, part, you've grown that with is, that, that technology. Is a good assumption, but it's not a fair assumption because Isn't what it? if? I mean, there's there's people who literally their mothers don't let them have a phone, right? Just for the sake of, I don't understand it. I don't know how it works. I don't know how to keep you safe. So that means you're not allowed it. Which mm. I guess is fair in its own sense because they're the parents. They're protecting their children. They don't know how to protect their children if they get a phone. Okay, what but, age are we talking here, though? Like, what's what's well, an appropriate I mean, age? Do you think to have a telephone as a as a kid? I think my friend still doesn't have a phone uh, because of it. How old is your friend? And, uh, uh, my friend's 16 now. 16. But she, okay, that's her, ridiculous. Her mother, and she's a girl, mother, she's a girl as well. Yeah. Bro, that's, I mean, okay, I'm not trying to be sexist here, but like growing up, there is a distinct difference growing up as a teenage boy versus growing up as a teenage girl. Do you know what I mean? Let me let me quickly look up the statistics of how how many... Children, I don't know how many boys to girls have phones and how much hmm. like do they use it? Yeah. You know, just because with what we were saying before as well, while you're looking that up, um, with regards to you know parents and and like raising their children and stuff. Um, it's right here. I found it. Uh, Quartafrica dot com hmm. it says um, gender inequality in tech starts with teenagers on their cell phones hmm. girls have less access to mobile phones than boys and when they do have access it's complicated by patriarchy a new study by non-profit girl effect and the vodafone F foundation surveyed th 3,000 adolescent girls and boys in 25 countries in south asia the united states and africa and found that the increased risks and lower opportunities girls faced in real life were only replicated on their mobile phones 
Okay. And globally, 184 million fewer women than men owned a mobile phone, according to the report. Teenage girls are usually lumped in with the women in gendered studies on phone usage, but the Real Girls Real Lives Connected report found that teenage boys are nearly twice as likely to own a smartphone compared to girls in countries outside the US. Hmm. So it's more or less that society barriers women inside of the you can't have a phone because you're a girl, and if you do have a phone, then you're faced with, you know, like, like sexual harassment, blah, blah, blah. But that's that's always been a problem. That's a pretty, but I pretty mad phone, thing, you know, because I would, easier. I would have thought that, like, owning a phone would make you more kind of... Um, I don't want to say safe exactly, because it's not quite the right word. But, like, growing up as a teenager, right? Like, okay, wh when I got a phone... I was uh, I was ten years old, right? And the idea behind me getting a phone at that age was so that I would be safe for whatever reason. If I needed to, I don't know. Let's just say something happened. I don't know. I I would have a phone. I would be able to call family and get help. Do you know what I mean? That was the kind of the exactly. basic idea for it. And then obviously, as you get older, as you become a teenager you know, you're going to be hanging around with your friends in, in places probably... I mean, it does kind of depend on your parents and what they let you do and such. such. But, like, let's be honest, most teenagers I guess it, tend to lie to their I uh, guess it, their parents and stuff and um, about where they are. I know I did. And uh, sorry, Mum. Yeah, I mean, I guess it tailors more to social media and the fact that most girls don't feel happy posting photos of themselves on, like, Instagram because they know that they're not as... Well, it's always in the back of their mind that they might not be as good looking as like models. Well, see, that's a and they always you're getting think that's onto it. You're, you're getting on to a different issue there, though. That's talking about social media and such. Like that is a factor, but, but I mean, it's, it's, it's the same. Like, it's, yeah, you can you can have a phone without having social media but i mean teenagers they want to be able to connect with their friends yeah i know i know i know i'm just saying that like way. at its at its core based on what we were talking about before with the whole parenting and and wanting to protect your children like you know you can't protect your children from, oh, yeah, from totally. eventually living a life and, and doing what they want like eventually at some point they will find a way be it you know leaving home or you know what i mean but like with regards to just the very initial starting thing of, of getting a phone for your own safety like to do okay let's talk about your friend like the fact that he doesn't own a, a phone at 16 means that throughout that time in situations where i don't know let's say she wasn't readily able to ha get him help him or something i don't know whatever the situation would be but you know what i mean right um he has no way of contacting her either so totally yeah i mean it's like irresponsible on her part to not provide him with a phone i mean for instance you can get mobile phones that don't have any fucking access to anything you know just calling mobile phones it's possible to have one of those those, those apps as well like you can buy your kid a phone but then put the security app on it so right, that, yeah and you can put restrictions so they can't access mm -hmm. like the internet but they can message but to be honest exactly. that that leaves them out of touch and it doesn't make them like it makes them feel safe because they know they can message and call their parents but then they want more yeah but at the end of the day i mean you know your your parents are they can be super restrictive and they can um inhibit what you do and if you don't know anything else other than that and you don't kind of stand up or rebel uh it, it comes down to the type of person you are i think i mean some people have some like brutal parents that you know they're scared of their parents so that's a factor but if they're not scared and it's that just a, a case of like you know they just need to stand up then if anything i think it's a, it's a worthwhile important lesson for them to learn you know you do have to stand up for yourself in life um even if you even your family you know what i mean um especially your family i think you know at the end of the day and this is kind of the quote that i wanted to drop in as well uh, the fact that, you know, generationally speaking, you know, we're different. And we are. The, you, the world that your parents are bringing you up in is different from the world that they were brought up in. You know what I mean? It's, it's changed yeah. over that time. And e even in, in the time that they're having you and raising you from 
childhood to teenage years and so on. It changes dramatically. So they're not really preparing you for that, you know. Uh, and if they are, then they need to have a very kind of radical kind of different approach than, than you know, the standard atypical uh, approach to parenting, I guess. Do you know what I mean? Like it's... Okay, like for me, me yeah, pers- I get you. yeah, like for me personally, I feel like most of my the growing up that I've done in life has occurred in my twenties. It, I was all over the place when I was a teenager. I'm not trying to like you know, say that my parents didn't do a good job or something, but like I feel that could they have done better? Yes. Um, did I have everything that I needed and was I taken care of and stuff? Yes. Um, were there things that happened at home that shouldn't have happened and situations and stuff? Yes. It's, it's like, I look at mine as, as very mixed, uh, uh, but mostly I'm, I'm very grateful and lucky, uh, compared to when I compare it to other people's, you know, I, I kind of try and look at things like that in life and, um, I try to see it as a kind of you're constantly reflecting and looking back and, and understanding like where you come from, what you had versus what other people had and so on. And in that sense, I'm, I'm very grateful. I mean, you know, even, even things like having the materials for school, you know, I never realized how that's important. Yeah. I never realized how, like I did kind of take that for granted I mean, I was always aware of it when I was a kid that, you know, we weren't, we were poor, we didn't have a lot. Like, I I was aware of that, but like, I never went without either. You know what I mean? And I knew kids that went without and it sucked. And it's brutal when you're a kid. You know what I mean? You're, (laughs) kids are brutal to each other. (laughs) There's no sympathy there. um i guess no, that's it, true i guess it gets a little bit better at teenage in teenage years but even st- even so i suppose it depends where you go to school and such but uh yeah man um if i can just quickly go back to uh parents go for it uh i think my stepmom my dad and myself all believe that there's a difference between being a good parent and being a good mother slash father mm-hmm. because a mother and a father make sure that their kid is you know clothed has enough food, yep. has enough warmth, yep. has a, a nice bed to sleep in. But being a good parent is teaching them the ways of the world. So, for example, I mean, you know about my mother. You, I've told you small parts about my mother that, you know, it, she's, she's a good mother, but she isn't the best parent. Because she made sure that I was fed, had a place to sleep, was comfortable mm. uh, in my clothes. But she never taught me the right lessons to help me become a better person. So I'm essentially starting from scratch with my dad because he is a good parent. He knows his stuff. He knows exactly where I need to be and what kind of person I need to be in the job world, etc. And he knows all that. And he knows that I haven't been taught a single drop of that until now. You know, it's weird. I never thought that we would... uh connect on on something like this but i i know exactly where you're coming from and i agree i feel like i had it the same um my parents obviously separated when i was uh, like two years old or something so i didn't really see my dad a lot he was never really around um and then we sort of had a relationship much later in life when i was like nine or ten years old onwards uh it's all good now but like yeah when i was a kid it was very difficult and such and um you know and i didn't understand and all of that there was that but the whole thing about you know was my mom a good parent absolutely um fantastic you know worked her ass off um defeated the odds constantly you know i have many fond memories of those times and and uh you know i feel like we got through a lot together you know so and i'll always look at it like that but as we got older, we had a very tense relationship. Even to this day, is there's a bit of tenseness there. And um, I put a lot of that down to us just being different people. You know, like I have a lot of respect for her as, as, a, as, a, as a person. Same with my dad. Um, and I think that's a key thing as well. Once you kind of become an adult and when you get older, I mean, it's a little bit different for you because you're, you're still 
you know a, ki- a kid in a sense you're you're older but you'll see what i mean when you get into like your 20s and stuff like the relationship changes but even at this point it's changed from say five years ago do you know what i mean yeah um, i mean i i have a i have a part-time job that i go to sometimes right, like right, right. Uh, my dad's boss, if he needs extra hands, mm. he'll sort of get in touch with me and ask if I want to, mm. if I want to come along and help him. And normally, I'll say yes because it's extra money and it's money that I can save and put towards stuff like driving lessons mm. or uh, like even my first car or yeah, a dog. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's it's helpful, but I don't know. Like it's this is technically my first job. And I have no job experience beforehand, so I need to sort of learn. And yep. my dad's boss teaches me because he knows that I haven't had job experience, mm-hmm. so he has a bit more patience when it comes with me. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know what? I mean, soak that up, man. <laughs> it's, it's good. To, it's Especially at your age as well. I wish I'd started working at 16. Uh, it would have helped And it's not me. exactly like it's like minimum wage. Mm. Like, the amount of money I get paid is... Like I'm not going to say how much, but it's it's more than min- it's a lot more than minimum wage, to be, and I'm to be honest, more than happy. Yeah, as well, the money at this stage is irrelevant. Like the experience is the most valuable thing, and and when you look, of back, course, the experience helps be... a lot, but the money right, right now, he, I need it. Like right. I need to start saving. Okay, cool. But it's it's also the experience that I need to take away from as well. Mm. Just bringing it back to to uh, what you were saying about the difference between the parent and the uh, and the mother and father thing. Mother slash father. Yeah, like I, I'll just finish what I was saying. That like you know, I felt like my parents were like that. You know, they provided for me. I was always. Prov- I think that's the key. Were you provided for? Yes or no? Yes. But were you equipped for life? Hell fucking no. When I left home at twenty one. I thought I was, I thought I was okay. And then as I went through my 20s to up to my mid 20s, it's only in the re- last couple of years that I really feel like I'm on top of things and kind of uh, not scared of the world anymore. Um, not scared of adulthood and taking chances, taking risks. But I was definitely scared before. And um, I, I, for a while... I did kind of blame the both of them for that. I felt ill-equipped. And the tricky thing is that, like, you can't put sole blame on your parents because, you know, we all make choices and decisions in life. We are in charge of ourselves. Like, if we want to make a change, we have to make it ourselves. But with that being said, the support and direction that we get from our parents is invaluable. So if it's not there, it's very difficult to understand where to start, or or like why you fit like i think for me the the, i learned a lot from you know dating people having friends seeing how their family lives were do you know me like comparing and stuff and i i begun to understand a bit more about how mine differed and and why that's important what that means and such but i don't yeah i don't really feel like i truly matured and learned about life until i left home but um Every, yeah, everyone's different. Like, I mean, just bringing it back to you now, uh, I find it interesting because I, what I was going to ask you is, is it your first time actually being in the Netherlands or is this just a planned thing that's kind of just been on the horizon and now you've kind of pulled the trigger? <clears throat> I've been I've, I've been talking about wanting to move since I was... Um, what? Uh, since I was... I've, I've been coming here since... Like I've been, I've been coming here for ten years, wow. and okay. it's been sort of just a holiday. But mm. when I was about nine or ten, I started wanting to be away from my mother and being with my dad. Right. Okay. So it's sort of, it's sort of been a smoking gun, mm. and the trigger I've pulled it, and I've moved. And you know what? I'm glad I have because. I feel better now that I'm here. Mm. I feel safer. I feel like I'm going to learn more, and I feel like I'm going to have a better life in general. Yeah, I mean, England uh, for me is filled with only limited opportunities, whereas I can become anything I want. Why do you? Here why do you say that? Why being held down? Because a lot. Okay, a lot of people would would disagree that the UK doesn't have a lot of opportunities. Maybe for someone like yourself, but you're. That's why I said uh, for me. Right. Because I feel like there's a lot of people that can accomplish a lot in the UK, mm. 
But for me, I feel like there's a lot more that I can do on the mainland. For example, when I go to work, we work in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, not the Netherlands. So if I feel like I can travel a lot more and be happier and sort of just sort myself out easier. But why don't you think Whereas that's possible for you in the I UK? What's what's holding you back there? The, the difference between here and there is that I know that my dad always has my back. Okay, so it's a family and thing. It's not. It's not actually about the country itself. It's more about the family situation. No, no. I think. I think the country, the UK, Great Britain. I think that's a great place. There's loads of beautiful places there. There's loads of great places to work. Loads of great schools. Mm. But that means living with my mother. Okay. Right. In order again, to do that, so and it, I feel like yeah. the dress would pull me away. I mean. It, it, it is an interesting thing, actually. When, when you, I mean, you'll find this as well when you when you eventually move out of home as well. Um, I'm, well, I suppose you will notice the difference now because obviously it's the first time you've lived with with your father's side, so there'll be that difference. But um, I found when I left home, finally, I was about 21. Uh, so this was about six or seven years ago now, and. Um, it was a bit i didn't really feel fully disconnected until i think about a year or and a half had passed i still felt like i was in the sphere of all of that you know like like there was always a chance i could go back kind of thing. not that i wanted to but it was like do you know what i mean i didn't really feel like i'd kind of done it just yet and um then as the, as the longer it got and the more time i spent away the more i kind of just sat and thought like hmm, I might never go back. <laughs> and like, I, I stayed there a few times here and there, but then I was just kind of like, yeah, okay, I think this is this is it now. This is sayonara kind of thing. And um, I think there's a lot of freedom to be I mean, found my dad, my dad has sort of welcomed me and my stepmom has also sort of welcomed me to stay in the house mm. um, that we moved to as long as I want to. Oh, that's nice. Just because they know that they know how hard going into the big world is their self mm. because they they've all gone and done it they've all gone and bought their first house their first apartment and they've been through it and they know how difficult it is so they're trying they're trying to sort of push me in the right direction so that i don't feel like okay when you're 18 you need to pack your bags find a place to live and move mm. it's sort of like you can stay here as long as you feel comfortable um so they need to the the, the Sorry, they're making sure that I know I'm welcome whenever I need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, I mean, rather than sort of kicking me out of my ass. Yeah, I mean that doesn't benefit anyone really. I've never agreed with that whole approach to things. I remember when I turned eighteen and I was told I needed to get a job and stuff. I felt very stressed, and it was important for me to get a job. I can see that now, but at the same time, like I just. I think what I really needed back then was guidance, like some sort of like actual guidance of like, hey, this is what you should be doing. This is what you should be focusing on. Like back then, if someone had told me like, hey, Christian, you should be focusing on, you know, things like YouTube and acting and music. And, you know, like I was doing music back then, but I didn't really have anyone like supporting me and saying, you should do this. Like, you're good at this. Like, this is what you should do with your life. Like no one was saying that. If anything, everyone around me was like, <coughs> why don't you have a proper job? And like, oh, you're working in this shitty place and blah, blah, blah. And it was like, it kind of, and especially now when I look back, I'm like, you know, support is such a key thing and so important. Like not, not just uh, things like financial support and like giving someone a place to live and, and kind of giving them a footing, but like more the emotional support of like, you know, positive reinforcement and just kind of having that environment that's positive in general. So I think for you, that's very promising for you. Like, I think that the, the, the key thing here is you need that like headspace. You need to like not feel restricted in yeah. any way and such. So and that's uh, moving uh, moving on to uh, a bit more about support uh my dad and stepmom both watch my videos okay. um, and when my stepmom was watching my video i heard laughing and that just felt like such a big boost mm. and my dad my dad was watching my video and he was he was lying sort of across the sofa and i was sort of sat next to him mm. and but i was just playing my game and at the same time i was sort of looking over to see what he was doing and he laughed a few times and 
he gave me a few fist bumps and he said, yeah, you're getting really good at this, son. And that's, that's what you missed out on is you missed that support, but it, it does help. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, 100%. I'm happy to share it here because I've never actually shared this publicly before. So if they ever do listen to this, this is the yeah. first time they'll hear this. But um, yeah, um, when I was in that first band that I was in when I was 18, uh, I was really proud of that. I started that band. I auditioned everyone. I you know put my heart That's and soul what you into cultivated. it. Yeah, I put my heart and soul into it. It was the first thing I ever really did. And I, I decided not to go to university straight away. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I had I had a real passion for this music. I took it very seriously. The band went for like two and a half years. It was gaining traction. It was doing really well. And in that time, not once did either of my parents come and see me play live, nor did they come and see me play live oh, in the years later when I would do acoustic shows. Uh, they've never seen me play live. They've never seen me perform live in any capacity. Uh, nothing. Uh, and occasionally, you know, from time to time, I might get like a little comment about like, hey, yeah, I like this video that you did. I like this thing that you did. But I've never really felt that kind of emotional support from them. And uh, it sucks. But over the years, I've just kind of learned to accept. I mean, because when you become an adult and you get a lot older, you you kind of learn to just get over things and not carry it with you because it's it, that stuff can sit with you and wear you down physically and mentally and it's just bad to carry uh that stuff and like there is a small part of me that still is a little bit sad by that but it, it, i've moved on but you know i've just kind of accepted that like that's just not their role in my life they're not supposed to be those sorts of people i have to kind of uh support myself and and kind of be excited for myself if things go well. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so but, I wanted. I mean, to... even all right, a lot of people don't know this, but I mean, I have a half brother. Oh wow! Um, okay, it's my dad and his and his like ex before my mum. Mm -hmm. And he 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 played live on the drums, mm -hmm. and my dad and stepmom both went to see him. Yeah, and they even even they saw him play. Yeah, it's important. It, it's, it's that it's that difference in support. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I, for, for me, it's a case of um, understanding what something means to someone and how much it means to them. Like, I, I have always kind of told this, uh, this kind of as a joke, but uh, this will give you an example. Like, I remember one time I was playing a gig that was within walking distance of my dad's house. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was some pub. And it was an all-day festival. And we were playing during the day. And I'd said to him several times throughout the day, like, hey, I know, you know, this isn't really the type of music you're into or whatever, but I'd love to have you there. It would mean a lot, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it's close to you. You could walk down for like 15 minutes and leave, you know. And uh, he didn't come to that either. And I was just kind of like heartbroken. And I think after that, I just begun to realize like, oh, they're just, this isn't going to happen. But, um, but it's sort of like that stereotypical thing that happens in a movie where like yeah. the, the, the kids, yeah. it's like a kid on stage he's like he's looking for his mom or his dad and he, he can't see them in the audience and he gets disgruntled and he doesn't want to do, do the you know, performance anymore do you know it's funny you mentioned that but back then i did actually have that feeling every time i played i was like there's a small hope in my heart that maybe like one of them would show up and they just never did. And <laughs> Jesus, this is starting to sound heartbreaking. This is not what this is. The reason that I brought this up is to kind of like further exemplify your point about like why support means so much at any age as well. Like e even now, if they would start showing support and, and really invest in themselves in, in what I do, I, I would be so grateful for that. You know what I mean? It, it might sound stupid and pathetic to some people, but I, I think that that positive reinforcement thing is so important. It's so important to know that your loved ones and and the people around you are proud of what you do and and actively support you and push you and say hey yeah you're good at this you should keep doing this because the thing is the reality is i am my own motivator everything i do in my life like for instance when i sat down and thought about whether i should do this podcast or not i had to just think like you know i had all these doubts in my mind and i was just like oh, what do i do and i didn't speak to anyone because there's no one to speak to so i'm just like okay fuck it, I'm going to go for this. And that's kind of always been my approach to it. But um, 
And this is. I co- feel like the uh, the podcast is slipping down a sort of sad route now. <laughs> oh no, it's fine. It's fine. Like if I think if anything is, it's good for it to have these kind of ups and downs. I mean, I, I've always kind of committed myself in adult life to be as honest as possible and forthcoming with these things. And I'm I'm not sad at all about this. You know, it it, it sucked at the time. But it gave me lessons about life and, it, you know, for instance, like I will not replicate these things when I have kids, for example. You know, it will be different when I have children, if I have children. Um, There's something that I'm not going to I'm not going to go into too fully, but I'm going to sort of sort of, uh, you know, chip away at a small sort of iceberg. Mm-hmm. The reason why my dad is such a good parent and such a good father is because his wasn't. He's he's doing literally the opposite of what his dad did. Yeah, and it's working. Yeah, it sounds logical, man. He 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 became the father that his dad wasn't. Yeah, and that is, you know what they say about stuff. How it, you can either let it define you, let it destroy you, mm. or let it strengthen you. And he let it strengthen him. Yeah, I couldn't agree with more with that. I think that's a really good attitude to have in life in general. I mean, because things inevitably go wrong. Things don't always go right. It's the nat- It's a series of ups and downs. I often like to compare it to like the sea and like harsh waves. That's that's what the reality of life is like. And so, like getting miserable about these things, getting brought down by you know the reality of life is is is. It'll never get you anywhere. If you if you sit there being bitter and carrying this stuff with you and being negative, you know, that's going to be your reality. Whereas if you're positive and you approach life with, you know, making the decisions that are right for you and you just go for things and sort of live life the way that you think it should be lived and, like, treat people the way... And that's what I need to learn is because mm. I don't open up to a lot of people and I've right, opened up right, more on this right. podcast than I have to anybody else in the past year. Blimey. And it's not easy. It's really hard to speak about something when you're uncomfortable with it. Oh, yeah. No, of course. I've been there, man. I For years, I didn't talk about this stuff, you know. Um, the- but I'm glad I can. I'm glad I can speak and advocate yeah. myself. I, I think the, the, the key point is being in a healthy place where you're detached from it in the sense that you've kind of you've gotten over it, you've worked through it and you've come out the other side and then you can just reflect on it. Cause that's how I see it. You know, like I, I used to feel pain with these things that I've discussed here. And now I look at it very differently. I just see it as like a distant memory. That's like, this is what you can learn from it. That's what you can learn from it. You know, cause life passes you by man. Life goes so quickly. And before you know it, you know, one year turns into five years, five years turns into 10 years. And <laughs> suddenly the past, I mean, it's the past. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of people that live in the past. I think that's the problem. And you can't live that way. You have to live in the here and now um, because that's all that really matters. Today is yesterday. Tomorrow is now. Pretty much, yeah. (laughs) But I try not to even do that as well because I think that, like, plans can change so much as well. Like from from day to day so like looking to the looking to the the future is important because that's where we're headed but at the same time it's like i don't know things it's ch- okay to look at the past as long as you don't let it define you yeah i, th- I don't think i think it's stupid to to let your past define you I mean, it's illogical because you're not the same person you never are do you know what i mean it's just because something bad happens to you doesn't mean that's a personality trait mm. that you should take like just just because, uh, let let's say, you're bereft, and some what what like, let's say you, one of your parents die, mm. shit happens, and you need to learn that you need to try and do them proud, and you need to move on. As hard as it would be, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be bloody hard. Mm. I can't imagine any of my parents dying, not even my mother. I think that would but, be like the people that I know that that's happened to. Um, they're very mature. Like, of course, I'm going to be sad, but. It should, you know, shit happens. I mean, people die, people move on. Yeah, but that that's to. different, well. though. That's like, um, that's never happened to me maybe either. It's because, but that, that's, my, that's um, different. My, that is different. Because I've seen a lot of people maybe die, my, uh, but like never, never like a parent. Like that, that would change you. 
that would change the way. Yeah, you but maybe, it. maybe, maybe so much has happened to me that I feel sort of numbed. But I, to I other guarantee, people who you know who have happy lives with their parents, it would hit hard. I guarantee, if something like that would happen, it would. God forbid, touch, touch wood. But um, it's different. I can I can tell it's different. I've I've seen I feel it. Like I've seen it's definitely people, gonna rock me. I've seen people go through shit like that, and let me put it this way, right? Like I said, they become way more mature afterwards. But the key thing I always remembered is that they're like very serious. It can turn a person that's all bubbly and full of character into a fucking serious person. Um, but the thing is, is for me, I don't know what happened to me. I don't know if anything ha has happened to me. But if it, it, like if at funerals and stuff, I don't cry. I just try and remember the good stuff, and I, and I feel numbed out from the sadness. I, I mean, I the, don't the think last that funeral I went through was. I don't think that's, that's was anything bad though. I mean, I don't think that's like a. Like I used to be like that. If I mean, but it, it's it's sort of like I see other people crying, and yeah, it makes me want to cry. But at the same time, stuff stuff happens all the time. I don't you think that that makes you numb. Sort of... I think it's it's coping strategies. It's different. Yeah, you because know, like you need to you need to learn how to you need to learn how to cope with it, of course. Because mm. if 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 you're really really close to the person who did die, you feel like you want to cry. But to me, I feel like. Your time's better spent trying to remember the good stuff that happened with that person rather than, oh no, they're gone. Mm. You should think about, yeah, but we went to the beach, we did, we did this, we did that, and it, and it was great. Well, let's be real, And though. it's going to be difficult to think like that. Yeah, but let's be real, like, it, it, grieving is a series of stages, isn't it? When it immediately happens and you're dealing with the aftermath and the funeral, I mean, that... You're rocked. Yeah, You're rocked. that's 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 gonna take you maybe a couple of weeks, maybe longer. Like it, it really depends on the person and the circumstances. And, and then you start to then you start to accept it, and you sort right. of like, okay, they're gone. And then and it you gets... start to do them proud. And then stage three is strength. Yeah. But like I, I think you feel that... like your your partner or your your husband or your your mother's death. You should try and do them proud and try and show them that just because somebody's gone in your life that led you to how you, who you are now, mm. you need to prove that you've learned something, I guess. But getting to that point that you were talking about where you can look back positively and be like, oh, these memories and stuff, I think it takes a while before you can get to that point. Do you know what I mean? Like it's And maybe, maybe just because I can do that faster, I think that's a good strength that I have. Potentially. I mean, I suppose it depends on I can, how close. I mean, other people can too. I think it depends on how close you were to the people that passed away as well. I think that's key. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wasn't very close to the to the person whose funeral I went to, but this at the same time, I, mean. I felt I felt how close he was to my dad. Right. Yeah, no, no. And I knew that it wasn't hmm. easy. I know. It's just I'm just saying. My dad like, barely ever cries. It's different when it's when you're closer to the person. Do you know what I mean? Like. Like for instance, I when, so, I, when yeah. I when I when I was growing up, I saw, I went to like a lot of funerals. Right, I went to like great uncle funerals, all this stuff. Right, Pe people that were like either old enough that you knew they were going to die, or or maybe they were younger but they had like a heart attack or something. You know, like there was a lot of that, and I felt the, the same as you do. I felt very numb. I was like, is there something wrong with me? I don't cry. I don't get like like I felt like the sadness of the event, but I didn't. I felt very like it's just a normal day, but it's a bit of a darker day. Uh, and then I yeah, I, like you, you're you're really sad and you you understand what's going on, but at the same time you don't know why you're not as sad mm, as the other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it's because of that that child innocence that you don't quite understand what death is. Well, no, because I was older. I was. But, I'm talking like uh, heading towards teen years and then teenage years. So it's like. I understand it fully. It's not, like I get what you mean. If if I was really young, then yeah, that, what you don't really get it, but. I was never in really like sort of you, you you sort of get you sort of get those questions from the kid like your kid and the like mm. what where's 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 Auntie Julie or what 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 yeah why can't I go and see her like and then you sort of have to get explained to that they're not there anymore yeah that's got to be difficult but to explain then that. but that that's a whole different that's a whole different problem in itself like do you tell the truth and explain what death is or do you just say that they're on holiday. Like, no, nah. <laughs> people that do that should go to I hell. I wouldn't know man. what to do. 
Can't say, oh, she's just like, gone people, on people holiday. Who said, people who said it, people who said to kids, people who said to kids that Santa isn't real should be should be chucked off a balcony. Oh yeah, no, I agree with that. Cause, that's just brutal. Because that, because like that's that's something that they look forward to, and, that, and, and it actually helps you in the long run because they go to bed hella early just so they can get to Christmas faster. Yeah. So you've given yourself a night off. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh my god, that's brutal. Don't have, don't have to don't have to deal with Timmy tonight because he's too busy dreaming about Santa Claus coming and putting a sack of presents under the tree. Yeah, let me just let someone break into my house and put stuff under the tree. I found out in such <laughs> I found out in such a brutal way. Sorry, kids, but yeah, Santa's not real. If you're watching, I really hope they're not or listening. But yeah, uh, when I was about no, I mean no, I mean if you're if you if Santa's Santa's magic wears off when you start to get older, but he's still there dude, for the kids. Don't worry dude, about it. If, like if you're a kid and you're watching this, he's still there. For you. When I was, uh, I must have been, what was I, year five, so I was, no, I was younger, I was year four. About 14, year, year 14, 15. Year four, so I was about... Oh, so that's like... Oh, eight years old, something like that, seven or eight years old, and uh, some girl from the year above heard that I was talking about Santa to another kid, and she was like, you believe in Santa Claus still? And I was like yeah and she's like oh my god you're so stupid yeah he's not real and i was like what and then when i got home i asked my mom and she like told me and i just felt this like sinking sadness i remember i remember the exact moment just sitting in the chair going oh it, it, that felt like someone had died <laughs> oh I was only a no, kid. No, my, but... my mother had to have. My, I I had it pretty much figured out because I I I stayed up sort of late from a young age. Yeah. So I sort of when Santa Claus had quote unquote. I mean, I went downstairs and I saw my stepdad literally eating the cookie. Oh. Like it, I was like, oh okay, okay, fair enough. Rip. Do you know? <laughs> I I remember my mum was really clever with Christmas. So like, we never really lived in houses. We lived in flats. And one year it kind of occurred to me like, huh. How, but how does he get in? We don't have a chimney. And I remember saying this to my mom. I was like, how does he get in? Like, we don't have a chimney. Like, w w what's up with that? And she was like, really calmly, she just went, oh, no, we just put the keys under the mat and he just opens the door like that way. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I <laughs> yeah, believe okay. for another two, three what? years. What? Where, where did you say you grew up? Brixton? Brixton? No, uh, Northwest London. So... Like, oh yeah, let's just le let's just leave the key to the front door under the mat in bricks in uh in northwest London. Yeah, okay. It, it was, was in that. a suburb. It was a safe area. It wasn't like that. We lived in a nice area. It was. A, it but was I mean, a even still, you don't know. You don't know who's around. Dude, right? First of all, it's so, something I mean, that you're telling. First sort of, of all, area, it's no something nice. that you're telling a kid. So that's kind of the point of why true, I told that. True, true. And secondly, <laughs> if somehow this was a real scenario i lived in a very safe flat we had like a security comm door and stuff like it was it's strange actually because it was very poorly built and shitty but like it was home and we were safe we never had any problems in that area it was really nice and we kind of lived in a shitty like block of flats in a nice area if that makes sense it's very strange <laughs> and then like the further you got to my school the nicer and nicer it got it is is a very strange area but yeah it was i was lucky in that sense nice area nice school all that jazz but um yeah i just found stuff like that really quirky and funny like how parents hide these things and stuff but like some parents make no effort with these things they just you know like i remember one time my mum was just like because she hated mitch doesn't drink milk so she was like, Christian, why don't we give Santa some wine this year? I think he would prefer that to milk. And I'm like, what? <laughs> why would Santa drink alcohol? <laughs> and it's just my mum just wanted well, did, to get some did you, wine. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did, you, did your mum never, never learn you shouldn't drink and drive? You're trying to make Santa crush or something? <laughs> don't drink and drive, kids. She just, she, she just wanted to have a drink. Fair play. <laughs> she had to get up super I'll, early. I'll help. I'll even help Santa finish it off if he doesn't drink too much, because he has to drive, you know. <laughs> oh man, 
God, I never thought I would be telling these stories on a podcast, Christmas stories. It was funny. Do you, did you ever get that thing where you woke up, like, really sick and early on the day of Christmas? Like, sick with excitement, but, like, sick, physically sick almost. No, because, I mean, I have a I have this weird thing where I don't like people watching me open presents, and I sort of <laughs> knew that in the back of my mind, that, okay, cool, I have all these cool presents, but people have to watch me open them. Uh Oh, you mean like around so fat sort of like, family? Eh. Oh. Yeah, like if it's just like uh. if it's just a couple people watching me open like a birthday present, that's okay. But like the whole family watching me open a present, that's like do, weird. do you know what? I, I will <laughs> say this. Um, I I loved Christmas with with my mom. It was really nice because what we would do was it was mostly just me and her, or later in, in later years it'd be me, her, and like my stepfather. Um, but it, Christmas morning was always beautiful because we would wake up. I wake her up at ridiculous hour, like four or five a.m., and she would just have to like begrudgingly wake up and have coffee and just sit there like, <laughs> like this kid's woken me up, fuck's sake. But we, it's Christmas, do you know what I mean? But she was always in a good mood, so fair play, mum. Um, but yeah, no, she play, she would sit there on the chair and watch me open all the presents, and it would just be me and her. And you know what? Thinking back, actually, because I haven't thought about this in years, but that was actually really beautiful and sweet. Um, and that would be how we would spend Christmas uh, originally in, in the morning for at least like the first three or four hours, and then we'd kind of wake up properly and stuff. And then eventually we'd go to my nan and granddad's and do like what you what you did as well where you'd have the whole family and i had the same thing when i was opening presents in front of the whole family it felt very uh exposing i would you say <laughs> just yeah but like what if what if you like how do you how are you supposed to act if you don't like the gift how is that socially acceptable like how what is the way to do that <laughs> is oh there? man uh yeah there is i mean there i guess is, i guess the is. way to do it and i guess the way i do it is yeah. because someone's given you a gift so either way it's going to be good uh, i mean you sort no, of have to that's... appreciate the fact that someone's went out of their way to get you something yeah but okay when you buy a kid socks or like shower gel you need socks dude yeah you need that who to get the fuck washed. buys kids socks it's a fucking kid grandmas you need to understand that they're a bit slow nah man come on that's unacceptable. <laughs> Even no, especially grandma. Grandmas, no. You just get them chocolate. Or grandmas never fuck up. Anyway, what are you talking about? <laughs> grandmas always know. To be honest, my my grandma one Christmas got me this huge box filled with like like designer like body washes. But I Damn. wanted those because I could smell like I could I could pick and choose which which one I wanted to take up to the bathroom. Yeah, and but use. we're talking that about was cool. We're talking about teenagers. This is different. Like I'm talking kids. Like teenagers, the 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 game is different. Like when you're a teenager. Oh no, my grandma never screwed up when I was a kid. She yeah. she got me a remote control car one year, and I never stopped playing with it. My great granny on my dad's side, bless her soul. She <laughs> she was a crazy old woman. <laughs> she hand knitted me pink gloves <laughs> and they were like the frilliest wooliest gloves you've ever seen in your life like fucking mitts and i i, I have a theory that <laughs> your grandmother single-handedly started the lgbt movement <laughs> nah man she was from a bygone i can't era. i can't say she, that she was i can't a, say that she was I'm a joking. great granny she was like uh so when i was a kid she was probably Ooh. in her 80s i reckon at that point. oh she's old, old old yeah yeah i was very lucky i was born because my parents had me when they were teenagers so i met all my great grandparents and such it's very i'm very lucky in that sense i didn't uh, uh because my i think i'm not sure when they but like my, i think my dad was in his 30s and my mum was in late 20s mm. when they had me so because the age gap now is my dad's 50 and my mum's like 44 45 that's mad, man. So it's a pretty big age gap. So I think my mum was in her like late twenties, and my dad was like early to mid thirties. Mm. So I I'd, I'd never met my great grandparents. Oh wow. Okay. But I mean, I guess I guess that was okay because I still had um, all of my grandparents, which was pretty cool. 
Yeah, I mean, that's what most people but, want, um, at least. That's what most people experience, isn't it? Is knowing their grandparents. I love my grandma. I mean, because my dad uh, moved to the Netherlands when I was about nine or something. Mm. Maybe eight, seven, I don't know. Some, somewhere, oh, I was six. That, that's right. Um, and my, my grandma sort of filled in. Like, well, not filled in as my dad figure, but, like, she bought me, like, the clothes she, that my mum didn't get me. Like, she... Well, not that my mum didn't get me, but she chipped in, mm -hmm. and uh, when my like my mum, myself, uh, my mum and myself lived in my grandma's house for a year as well, and my grandma took me in when I got kicked out of the house that time. Oh, nice. Um, she took me in for a week, and I literally almost gave her COVID because I had COVID oh, symptoms. Shit. So I was like, I was restrained to uh, the back bedroom. But she still provided for me. She brought food up. She brought sweets. She she made Aww. sure that I was comfortable and happy, because she understood that I was stuck in that goddamn room. Dude, that's a real great. And she was over <laughs> the moon when she was no no. I was on the phone to the doctors, and yeah. when I found out the news that it was negative, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, "Grandma, it's negative," and she almost like jumped down the stairs. <laughs> like, oh shit! <laughs> she, she, like. If, she, she she sort of like did a little hop with excitement and yeah. she almost like tumbled and fell down the Fucking bed. Hell, that would have been bad. She was really really happy. Yeah, 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 but yeah. my granddad's sort of like a grumpy, like one of those grumpy people. So he's sort of like, oh, at least you didn't give us COVID. I was like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> at least but you no, didn't I, fucking I, kill I, us. I sank them some tip. Yeah. At least you didn't bloody kill us, like. Yeah. But I mean, at least I didn't have COVID. At least I didn't give the her anything. But I mean, I'm I'm happy that you took me in. And I'm I'm more than happy. All right, let's switch things up. So um, that kind of proves that I can do this without any preparation. So that's good. That's, that's very good. I've Sometimes learned... winging it is best because Absolutely. I had zero script for today and it worked. So Right. Uh, so now I'm going to introduce you to what I normally do, which is throw interview questions at you. So are you ready? Yes. Okay. What are your goals and aspirations for YouTube? I want to be able to get a thousand subscribers by the end of the year. Mm. That's I'm not setting too big a goal, but yeah. that's pretty much what I want to be able to do because that opens up a lot of opportunity. Because I'm pretty sure you can start getting monetized with a thousand. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure you can also um, do YouTube stories, which helps when I don't want to make a big YouTube video about something. Hold on, but YouTube also the fact stories. that I've heard of this before. Like, have you never been scrolling through on your phone and you see, like, little snippets of, like, sm like small videos, like, Instagram stories of YouTubers sort of saying, oh, I'm going to be putting a video out, so make sure you're ready, without having to, like, tweet it or something. And also, those stories on, don't just get shared to subscribers, they also, yeah, on YouTube, like, on the, on the app. Ah. I'm not sure if it's on PC, but on the app, I've uh, never seen it's that. definitely there. I've never seen that before. And also, um, okay. it it sort of it doesn't just get shown to subscribers. Uh, outsiders can see it as well, mm. and you can also start getting recommended on YouTube. So, my goal is a thousand by the end of 2020. Yeah, that's kind of the main goal I have as well. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get it. Um, I have I have a bit of catching up to do to you, dude. Mister. I think you're. How, how many are you on now? 120. 120. And what were you on when you started the year? Uh, I didn't start at the year. I started a few... M Wait, let me see where my first video was. My first video on this channel specifically... So you've had previous was... channels then? Was... No, it was the same channel, but under different names. Uh, okay. So I start. I didn't start from zero subs. I started from. I think it was. I think I had. Yeah, I had twenty three subscribers three months ago. That's a. My first video was three months ago. Yeah, that's that's incredible. So you've you've grown by at least a hundred subscribers in the space of three months. That's excellent. Yeah, just less than a hundred subscribers in three months. Very good going. I I think. To be honest, I mean, you're still establishing your... I mean, you've got very few videos on there. So obviously, like, you get need to get more content out there. But you're starting to establish your series now. So it's like, 
you're going to slowly yeah. pick up those views, slowly pick up those subscribers now because like, people will have those, you know, your vlog series to... Um... In total, I have 1,507 views. That's decent for total channel But views. I can already see that my brand new video, which came out two hours ago, was at 18 views. Hey, whereas the video that I put out... Whereas the video I did yesterday is on 18 views, which is a whole day ago. Yeah. But in two hours, I've almost gained 20 views, which also leads me to believe that in a day, that's going to rack up as well. Mm. I think the key, especially with the type of content that me and you make, because it's kind of similar on the vlogs uh, front, is that you're trying to build up a, a regular audience. So it doesn't really matter how, how big that audience is. It could be five people, it could be 50 people. Like you, want I believe I be... have about 20 people who constantly come and check yeah, what I'm yeah, doing, yeah, yeah. which is tr why I try and build some sort of schedule. Like I try and upload at least one video a day, mm. whether it be long or short, and I'm going to start sticking to that more. Okay. Because, I mean, I've recorded in front of my dad now. I've recorded in front of Nadine. Mm -hmm. And... Nadine's my stepmom, by the way. Cool. She's sitting right here. Thank you for not saying anything through the podcast. <laughs> You're allowed to say hello. No, I got a thumb up. She doesn't want to speak. <laughs> She's a bit shy. <laughs> Bless. But, um, yeah, it's, I don't feel nervous recording in front of Dad and Nadine, whereas my mum doesn't even know I have a YouTube channel. See, I find that um, so I feel like I can record a bit more freely. Is that hmm? is that because you've kind of kept it? from her or is that like just ignorance i've kept or... it from her yeah because okay. she's gonna watch one of my videos she's gonna see that i swear and then she's gonna kick off and demand that i like delete my youtube channel which i mean i'd never do but i just saved myself the argument because mm. uh one one more argument with mom is enough to make me throw her into a window it's a tricky one as well because parents do at least for the, the, the you know up until you're 18 they do have that kind of control over you at least while you're living under their roof i suppose it's, it's, it's a very tricky one to, to but just know. to go on sorry just to just just to compare my mum does not know i have a youtube channel at all mm -hmm. whereas my dad and nadine have subscribed to my videos and both watch them that's good do they give you any critiques on how you can improve them and stuff yeah like, my dad was sitting watching my video, and he gave me at least three fist bumps, and he said I'm getting really good at it, and I need to... Oh, right, you like, said... Like, he, yeah, he yeah. said, he was saying throughout, like, he loves the cuts that I do, he likes the music, he likes mm. the sort of funny little edits I put in. Oh. And he, 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 he genuinely he said to me that he would watch this if he didn't know me. I agree. I like the edits that you do. Like, I, I really am enjoying the vlog so far. Um, Thanks, man. I, I think it, it, it was a smart... When you told me that you were going to... As soon as you moved to the Netherlands, you were going to do this vlog series. I was like, this is excellent. You know, it's a British guy moving to the Netherlands as a young guy as well. He's 16. It's a, you know, it's a coming of age kind of story. And yes, we are back. Or rather, Dutch Deals is back from his break. So. I'm what... good. I'm, not, I'm, I'm still alive. Don't worry about it. <laughs> what future series can we expect to see on your YouTube channel? Well, depending on how well it does and what I'm looking at, I don't think the um, the Dutch uh, uh, lessons are going to go forward. Why is that? Um, I mean, maybe maybe they might pick up a bit more traction, but right now the first video is sitting on 18 views. Actually, Dude, I, I think it's you, sitting on 13. You need to sit on this stuff a bit longer, you know. You've only just released it a couple of days ago. I know, that's what I said. I said uh, I'm going <laughs> to wait a little bit and see what happens, but... Yeah. You gotta, you gotta promote I the shit out of this think, stuff as well. I think, I think it won't, but I think it will. I th uh, true, I don't, I don't promote as much as I used to, but I, I think it, it's. I mean, it's not just about the quantity as well. It's like kind of maximizing everywhere you can. I mean, you mentioned before that you've spent a lot of time on things like thumbnails and and uh, titles and tags and stuff, and that stuff is all really important. But you've also got to look at like. The tags you use on places like Instagram and Twitter and uh, you know Facebook even and all of the places that work for you, but you know like kind of maximizing the potential areas that you could reach out to your audience. Do you know what I mean? Because I mean, you, you exactly. mean you both know YouTube videos. Okay, for what you're doing, it's tricky because you know unless you're doing a very specific topic, 
uh, it's going to be hard for people to find you because it's just, there's millions and millions of vloggers. Do you know what I mean? But every now and again, like for instance, you being in the Netherlands as a British guy, right there, that's something that's not like necessarily the most unique thing ever. So there's there's something where you can like kind of make yourself more unique, you know, factor that into like video titles and you know <laughs> tags even, you know, British man in Netherlands, you know, blah blah blah. There's like a narrative to be told there. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I do, I do think it's interesting to see how you move forward with your YouTube channel and how you adapt it, and you know whether or not you factor in a lot more of um, being in the Netherlands and and the culture and everything, and and kind of bring that into your videos. You know what I mean? I think that's going to be a very interesting thing to uh, see as the coming months and years progress. But um, yeah, I mean, I think you've got something going with those those vlogs, man. Um, but yeah, I'm just interested to see. Yeah, you can see. definitely expect to see more. And uh, there might be sort of less exciting vlogs, but there's going to be more uh, frequent vlogs for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of people that say with YouTube that it's, you know, at least in the beginning stages, it's about just uploading regularly and getting as much content out there as possible. And I think that certainly with your channel that's the case it's it's you know we just need to get more of you out there so there's more content to consume and um you know more of a chance for people to get to know you get to know who you are um because it's, it's funny how quickly things progress you know i watched an old video of mine that i did back in february and i think i look way more confident talking to the camera and just kind of switching the camera on and just speaking because back then it was really hard and slow and i don't know i i mean i think i made some interesting points there but it was not the i didn't have the the level of confidence i have now and i think you know you kind of seem to already have ex like confidence as soon as you started doing it so i'm very interested to see where this is going to head in terms of that level i mean i I, uh, I told a bit of a white lie Go on. um because um it didn't because w the way youtube works is it doesn't give live uh data of how many views you're sitting at mm. whereas youtube studio does and it says that <laughs> my popular dutch phrases is sitting at 20 yeah. rather than 13. Uh, I so don't know it kind of goofed up there. So that. 20 seems like such a better number than uh, 13. So you, actually, you might start to see a lot more stuff. And I'm even looking back at older views, hmm. uh, older videos, and even older videos are climbing. Like yeah. one recently surpassed 100, and now it's on 104. Um, how to get YouTube famous is at 121. Yeah. And my first video was at 231 when last time I checked it was at 223. So, yeah. depending on how f how much further this goes, that you might start to see more of stuff that I start to feel confident with. But as it co where it comes to um, vlogs, I'm not sure what's going to be up next. But I think it's going to be a small, more relaxed vlog in um, in sort of. You know, because of the large vlog, you know, today, that was 12, 13 minutes long. Yeah. Which is perfect amount of time for a vlog, but that was shot over an entire day. Wow. As opposed, And I only used 12 minutes of footage as opposed to the 15 that I actually recorded. You know, I, uh, I often but... do this, this strategy where I have, like big vlogs or not necessarily vlogs but like big videos that i've planned way ahead of time that are like as you said the ones that kind of like inv involve a lot of editing and take a lot more time and then like the extras that are not planned that just like happen as and when are like supplemental um content so you set yourself like a a specific like schedule like okay i'm definitely gonna upload like these two days a week or whatever and then everything else is just extra and it just fills up your channel and gives people more but um there's so many different ethoses do you know what i mean there's some people that say that you know you should just upload all the time and every day sometimes multiple times a day and just get as much out there and then there's other people that say like less is more and that you should just do it like once a week or something and it's 
I guess it really depends on what works for you specifically, you know? Okay. Um, I think I want to start a new series. Uh, I said I wanted to get 15 likes on the Where Things Stand video in order for me to make a tea time segment, okay. which would happen on a Saturday night where I make a cup of tea and I just talk about what's generally going on. Hmm. And it's on nine likes, but Close. I do really want to make it and I feel like it would be a good sort of start because I haven't seen anybody else do it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the the key element, isn't it? Is trying to either find uh, a different way of doing something that people have done already, like an interesting take on an existing idea, or yeah, to come up with something original. And um, I think with you, I don't know. I mean, I I kind of know. I think we got like a very similar approach to YouTube in in so much as like we prefer to talk about our own lives a bit more and and kind of you know work on our own characters rather than you know maybe doing commentary channels and talking about other people you know what i mean now there's there's so many approaches on youtube these days and i think i sort of i don't know why i just disagree with commentary channels i mean i watch them and i'm okay with them but it's sort of like they're just sort of pointing out other people it's not like they're stealing content because it's their own content. They're sort of putting out their own opinion. Mm. But, I mean, obviously you're going to have people who judge stuff, but it's not really anybody's business other than the original content maker. I know what you mean. Like, my... And I'm not sort of, I'm not sort of saying I disagree with it, but I'm just saying I'd prefer... Mm. I, I know what you mean. Like, I, I have a little bit of an issue with commentary channels, and I, I'm the same as you... There are a few that I sometimes watch. They're more like critiquers than commentary channels, though. Like you know, of like reviews and and such, like uh, re review channels more more so. Um, but the the issue that I have with commentary channels is that they're often very very negative and critical with other people, right? Like to like a very extreme degree. Uh, and sometimes they're really really not nice. Like un like there's it's one thing if you're critical but like you're being reasonable and then it's another thing if you're just attacking people you know what i mean and i feel like many of them are bordering on attacking people but this is the issue if you're shitting on other people and saying like oh this person is bad because of x y and z reason but then you don't personally produce any original content of yourself then do you know what i mean it, it, it's like okay you let's... have to do two in order to be because it's, it's fair enough to just sit back and point at other people for doing wrong things yeah. but you have to actually put your own stuff out and then that's going to be critiqued yes you know because then it's not really you know fair it's just sort of like police officers who don't obey the law it's just well, it's, it's like you it, need it's to like be if, able to if you posted a, a song tomorrow and you were singing and I said, and I critiqued it, and I said, this is bad because of X, Y, and Z reason. You probably look at my comment and be like, okay, well, Christian has sung for many years. He's been a musician for many years. So maybe I should take this into consideration, right? Whereas if, I, if I've never sung a day in my life, I've never produced any music, and I just turn around and go, yeah, it's shit, and I think it's shit because of this reason, this reason, and this reason. And you're like, well, okay, that's your opinion, but like, You've never done it, so you don't really know... Who are you to judge me? Yeah, but like I feel like if, if you kind of walked in someone's shoes, you know what it involves, what it entails, then it's like... It's not, it's not to say that people who... Okay, you can have an opinion about something and have never done it, but I think that the, you can't expect that your opinion is going to be like fact or like, you know like taken really seriously like it's the only truth do you know what i mean it's basically i i guess i'm saying that an opinion is more weighted when it comes from someone who's actually experienced or gone through it something themselves or done it themselves i don't know that's my two cents on that yeah <laughs> yeah um no i understand i understand where you where you come from mm -hmm. it's sort of it's it's like it's like you to play a video game that I've been playing for a couple of years, yep. and you were to just start. But at the same time, you have to pick what you say. For example, you don't just say your shit because this, this, and this. You say, "Yeah, okay, your shit," but I feel like you can improve by doing this, this, and this. 
Well, that's and it's up, then it's up to the creator again to sort of return and sort of say, okay, I'm going to give this, this, and this a try and see what happens. Hmm. Or to just ignore it and just continue to do your own thing. Yeah, It's really up to the creator at the end of the day. Of course. And that also, you touched on a good point as well about how you deliver that criticism. Because there's a lot of people that don't deliver it constructively. You know, I get a lot of negative comments that just, <laughs> they'll just say like, oh, this is wank. Or this is shit. And it's like, okay, great. Like, what, what do you want me to do with that? Like, <laughs> that doesn't tell me anything. What, my what, my response to hate comments, especially if it's people that I know. Yeah. Like for example, the other like the other month, I uh, the video that I put out, uh, somebody somebody that I knew from school commented, and I knew he was salty because he tried something with his channel and it started to work, but then people got bored of it, so hmm. he tried to do something different and people weren't interested, so his channel just slowly started to lose views. I think you told and, me about this actually. I vaguely remember. Yeah, this. exactly. And he, he posted he put actually let's let's see if I can remember which video I think it was the Where Things Stand one actually. Um Has he stopped uploading? So he stopped uploading, yeah, and I, I had a conversation mm. with him about it. I said, I can help you if you want help to sort of Ooh. regain control of your channel. Nah. I can help you sort of get your channel back out there again if you want. I bet that went down like by a helping you. Sick. <laughs> no, he started. He started to listen, which is the oh. weird thing. But then he, he, but then he just sort of was like, "Nah, can't be asked." Well, that's issue number one, right? And I was there. like, "Well, it's it's completely it's completely up to you. I'm not telling you to do anything. Mm. It's entirely, you know, your own prerogative. You just have to put the because at the end of the day, I have I have nothing to do with his channel. It's it's his channel. At the end, you know, every every time someone so, has given me like some sort of feedback like that, where they've said, "Oh, you should try this because what you're doing now isn't really working," or something like that. I feel this immediate feeling of like, oh shit, and like, not anger, but like annoyance, but then I just kind of get over it, because, you know, I'm not a child, and <laughs> I kind of like, just digest what they say, and then I try it, and I, I swear to God, nine times out of ten it works, and then I just end up praising that person for the next week. <laughs> like, Thank you okay, so, much. so he's, he's removed his comment, but it said something like, when, when's the... When's the first time you're gonna do a video that doesn't, you know, make me completely like depressed or whatever? It was oh, something like yeah, that. I it was, it was using comment, that yeah. word. And so I said, uh, "Thank you for shopping at Sainsbury's," because his comment meant nothing to me. So I thought I'd say something that meant nothing to him. Mm -hmm. And then he said something else. Um, so I said, um, "If you need customer service, please call the number." Or go to help.sensibrees.com or something. And then he stopped responding. So I was like, yeah, okay, I win. So... With a weird fucking troll comment. <laughs> but yeah, whatever. It works. It works. <laughs> no, it's because it's cause I, it's cause I had a... It's because I recently had a shitty experience in uh, Sainsbury's. I think something happened and I got annoyed. So I just put my stuff back and left. So... <laughs> Okay. I, I said thank you for shopping at Sainsbury's. You know, it's, it's it was a completely random comment that just came to my mind. But I said, you know, if you're going to tell me something completely useless, I'm going to give you something just as useless, except a bit of a troll because I really don't care about your opinion. <laughs> All right, let's switch it up. Are you Twitch streaming or doing any sort of streaming elsewhere outside of the YouTube sphere? I stream on Instagram a couple times, okay. uh, but as for Twitch, I don't think I'm quite ready to do that yet. Okay. Um, I want to, but I, you know. But what? I don't have any sort of following on Twitch, so I feel like to stream and get like no v zero to one view, hmm. it would just sort of put me down, and I don't really want to do that. So, but on Instagram, I get a couple of viewers who uh, come. And drop by and say hello and it makes me feel good because um you know they're my friends as well i've never figured out how to do they... instagram live i still have no idea how to do that <laughs> well yeah. do you know do you know how you sort of put out a story and you press sort of on your face and then you go yeah. to the stories bit yeah that's how you, you just swipe it. along until it says like live because you could do all sorts of like you can take a normal photo or you Damn. do a boomerang or you can do a live Wow, oh, there you go. That's how you do it. <laughs> Fair enough. 
that's that's the way it's done. So, uh, um, what? I do one tonight, actually. If you want to drop by. What encouraged you to do Instagram lives? Like, what was the uh, inspiration behind doing that? Well, I mean, I sort of wanted to. I wanted to sort of see. It was more of a curiosity thing. I mean, like, out of mm. out of all of my friends that I have on Twitter, how many would sort of drop by and say hello if I did a live video? And how and many on average? To my surprise, about. I think the maximum I reached was about ten viewers. It's decent. Very I mean, but obviously they they came, they came and went, but a couple stayed. I think about three or four stayed. See, that's decent. If you're holding, and it was it, yeah, holding that many people. What what did you do in in the Instagram lives? Like, what do you do? I was just chilling. Like in the first one, I was just playing some games and sort of responding to what was being said to me. And then in the second one, I was sort of over by the bench, and I was with my friend. I did a live video with him, and I just made some food and sort of again, just sort of responded to what was being said in the comments it's pretty cool that you can retain people purely just on your own personality and just chatting to people and, and getting getting people kind of interested in you and wanting to just sit and listen to you talking i think that's really impressive like not many people can do that like a lot of people have to have something in addition you know like playing a game and maybe they're commenting over it or you know as you, yeah other people to help them or, or whatever the case may be like but it's pretty cool that you can do that, you know, just based on pure personality alone. That's, that's impressive. Yeah, I mean, I've added you. I've added. I've just followed you there on Twitter. I mean, if I uh, if you follow me back, it, uh, if I was to wait, you don't um, start. Wait, a, I don't follow uh, you on Twitter. What do you mean? Yeah, I do. No, I'm sorry, not Twitter. <laughs> uh, Instagram. So if I start. An, if you, if you if you follow me back on Instagram, yeah, you'll uh, receive a notification when I uh, start doing live videos mm, okay cool that's not gonna annoy me at i mean all. obviously you don't you don't i mean i don't do it that often and if you want to drop by then i'll probably drop by sometime, um yeah. and i've just seen there that you actually have an established spotify um podcast i do which is what you're going to appear and on I s oh bugger uh, <laughs> 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 i told you man it's a podcast a legit podcast. <laughs> you told me this, yeah, you, yeah, I did. fair enough, I did. <laughs> fair enough. You knew what you were getting into, sir. <laughs> to be fair, this is a bit of a switch up from the normal style that I do. But like I said, we're get, we're getting more into the interview style questions now. Obviously, we had a bit of a tangent at the beginning, which is normally not how it goes. Normally, it goes in and out of interview questions and uh, tangents. But I was not prepared with you, which I thought would be fun. Um, but I, I, th I think I've asked, asked the kind of key questions so far. I think at the end of the day, the key things in your life right now are YouTube and moving to, to the Netherlands. But is there anything else big happening in your life at the moment? For instance, you know, you've just finished school. So presumably, and you're working. So are you looking at like moving to some sort of college in the Netherlands or what, what's the kind of yeah, plan I'm with that? Yeah, I'm going to go to, I live in, I live in Vals and the, uh, the school that we're looking at is in uh, Maastricht. Which okay. is about a twenty thirty minute drive. Well, if probably twenty if my dad's driving. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's it's going to be a good start. But they don't start opening until September twenty sixth. Mm. I think it was. Mm -hmm. So it's I think it's, it's I think it's a bit though. less than that maybe. Um, but I, I'm not sure exactly when it starts. But I still have about just less than a month. I'm going to start focusing on sort of figuring out a, a sleep schedule and I'm still, I mean, there's the house move so there's mm. going to be that's going to be a vlog as well oh yeah do you know so I, 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 to... I hadn't even considered the fact that it's nearly August where the fuck is this year gone man what the hell <laughs> this is this is Alice, crazy Alice is yeah. Corona yeah Alice is Corona it's just every thing is coronavirus man you need to stop and listen <laughs> eaten everything open your eyes to the world man i think it's because of the whole hysteria of is, instead of people keeping track of what day it is be, because everybody's in quarantine mm. or lockdown or sort of social distancing mm. everybody's sort of not paying attention to the time because they don't have to go to work or do whatever so the sort of everybody's not 
paying attention to what time it is. So time's just passing by, whereas normally you'd have a reminder of what day it is. See, I've been keeping track of the time and the day. I've just and I've been working really hard, exercising, working on YouTube, the podcast, Twitch, all sorts of things. Yeah, you look you look friggin' ripped, man. No, I'm really not. That's 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 a joke right there. <laughs> <laughs> you just kissing my ass right there. <laughs> but I appreciate the compliment. Oh, that's a lawsuit. That's a lawsuit. Uh uh-uh. <gasps> Oh yeah. Uh uh-uh. <laughs> anyway. uh. Uh-uh. Anyways. You mud! You mud! You oh my god! What are you doing? Ah, uh-uh. are you mud? I don't even know how to respond to that. Moving swiftly on. Dude. So, with the, Wait, do you have, do you have any, do you have any particular ideas with regards to what you're going to study? Are you looking to move to university? Obviously, because that's on the horizon. You know what I mean? That's only two years okay, away. Okay, so. I'm going to start the college whenever that starts. Yeah. And I'm going to take engineering, mm-hmm. mathematics, and ICT. Um, after I've been there for about two years, mm-hmm. I'm going to... Because uh, you have to stay there for two years, and I need to learn Dutch anyway, so that helps. Because it's a, it's a dual language school, so it welcomes uh, people who aren't Dutch, and it teaches them Dutch, as well as the lessons that they take. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to learn Dutch and sort of get a hold of that a bit more. Mm. And then after two years, I'm going to sort of look for an apprenticeship uh, and work with motor vehicles. Oh, because, wow. Okay. Um, I'm really interested in cars. Ah. So, yeah. I ne- Do you know, I never would have thought of that oh. looking at you. I never would have guessed that. That's, that's interesting. We learned something. Oh, new. no, I, I watched Top Gear growing up uh, right, right, pretty right. much every single time it was on. I'd ask my uh, grandma if she could switch it to Dave. Mm. to watch Top Gear. Hell <laughs> oh, yeah, on Dave and Dave Javu. And I fell in love. Yeah, Dave and Dave Javu, oh my god. Good times. Taking taking us back now. Absolutely. That's did, when the BBC was good. Do they, <laughs> do they still replay Top Gear on Dave and Dave, Dave Javu? They, they must. They, they play old ones, yeah. They yeah. play old and new ones, and also on Netflix Ugh. they have the older ones as well. Ugh, who wants to watch the new ones? Ugh. Yuck. Oh, no thanks. No, uh, uh. I've seen enough Matt LeBlanc and friends, I don't need to see more of him when he tries to know what cars do. <laughs> this is a car, and it and it goes fast sometimes, but sometimes when it's off-road, it doesn't go as fast because it can't get enough grip. I know cars! You know, like... Is that a genuine quote? But... Ev- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, word, I, think, I think that's what he says in the changing rooms before he... Um, cars do stuff, and they go fast. But not when they're off road because they go slower. Well, you heard it here first, guys. Dutch Deals does Merca. not like. Dutch Deals does not like Matt LeBlanc. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that I don't like him. It's just I've seen enough of him in Friends to to know who he is. I don't need to see him. Well, in that's Top just Gear him playing the character, that though. Well. That's not necessarily him. I think I think the the wider issue with with Top Gear, the reboot, was that you know they just threw a bunch of people together with no chemistry, and you know it just didn't work because. Said, no. right, we'll take we'll take uh, Matt LeBlanc, we'll call him from America, awesome. Uh, we'll take Chris Evans from BBC Radio 2, because why not? And we'll take this, uh, I don't, who, who's this again? <laughs> I can't remember the other person. Who was the other person? I think they have like four or five people now. That's but ridiculous. The thing is, is Top Gear is, <laughs> is, is meant to be a trio. Well, it doesn't have to be, I but like, I think that... But it's it's just like, it's iconic after James May, Richard Hammond and Jeremy Clarkson that it's a trio. The, yeah, but the thing, the reason that it, does, it doesn't matter like how many of them there are, what matters is the chemistry between them. Like with those three, they established very early on that they just had this kind of natural chemistry and they played off of that and almost like formed a kind of a narrative on top of that. Do you know what I mean? They played Yeah, because it, it was sort of like, it's sort of like they can, they don't really... They, they love each other and they would help each other, but they sort of hate each other at the same time. But sometimes they form up together to go against the other one. Yeah, I love that when that happens. Those episodes are great. When they prank I each used other. To, I used to sit and wait for the episodes, like the specials, where they take three cars oh, I love uh, those. on a yeah. budget and they go somewhere. But yes. now they've literally made... But they've listened to fans and that's literally what the Grand Tour is. They do it every single time. And it's perfect. Damn, maybe I should get start watching that. 
Sounds good. You should watch the... Uh, yeah, just uh, download Pro- uh, Amazon Prime, uh, start yourself an account, oh, CB- buy the subscription, CBS, and you CBS. can start watching the Grand Tour today. What, is this a fucking paid placement? Jesus. <laughs> I haven't even got sponsors yet, yes. mate. You're plugging stuff. Unbelievable. Yes, man. <laughs> All right. Yes. Let's move away from this and focus on... Okay, you've told us about YouTube. You've told us about Twitch. you told us about your plans kind of outside of that. You know, you're... Actually, before we move on, yeah, are you thinking maybe in the future that given that you're going to be studying cars and stuff, do you think you'll bring that into your content creation? Do you think you'll speak about those things maybe, incorporate that into your what you do? I mean, I don't see why not. I mean, vlog... I mean, a vlog is a vlog, and mm. I can make it whatever I want it to make it. But as long as it doesn't infer- interfere with my work too much, right? And my boss is okay with it. I mean, I don't see why not. Sure. So, do you think maybe you, you're not like necessarily like fully set on pursuing YouTube as a career at this point? Like, maybe it's we'll see, like you're kind of in, right a, now, in a stage uh, of like the- figuring things out, kind of thing. Well, I mean, it seems reckless to sort of not do college and oh, of course, yeah, no, of completely, course. completely focus everything on YouTube when I have 120 subscribers. But I might, if if I say gather for some reason a million subscribers when I'm at work, I definitely <laughs> if if they're starting to if they're starting to overlap each other, yeah, I might consider quitting my job in order to pursue YouTube. Mm. Well, I am, um, but that I... would be. But that would be a big sacrifice because although I have a million subscribers, I need to also take into consideration my views. I would say getting yourself a qualification like what you're doing now with the idea of getting like a... Definitely. So that I have something to fall back on. Precisely. Yeah. It's a very good idea. Plus, are you working in customer service style roles now? No. I work... um, You don't have to give us any specifics. I work sort of... Well, I, I do... I do tree care and gardening. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. For private, private, private contracting. So interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, again, that's another useful skill right there. That's something you can always do as well. Like if if need. I mean, in, I have to tell you, when I went to work on Saturday, I did not expect to haul fifty kilo buckets of soil up a pair of stairs, <laughs> which I which we then put into wheelbarrows and wheeled across to the back of the house, where we then tipped said buckets into this sort of ground of soil where the trees were going to be, yep. put the buckets back in the uh, wheel, uh, wheelchair, into the wheelbarrow, and then take that back to the stairs. Welcome to Europe, Dills. To then go and get more. I did that for at least three hours, and we had two trailer fulls of soil. Yeah. My god. I've worked I got on... home and I felt broken. I feel like I've done a, like a massive workout. I remember when I was working in Estonia, I I worked on a couple of farms and did some real labor. And I remember thinking back then that, because before that I'd worked in like supermarkets and and done like some pretty physical stuff, you know, lifting wine cages, guys, is is tough, all right? But um, then I just laughed because when I started working on that farm, I was like, everything I'd done before, nothing. This is the real hard work right here. (laughs) It's just strenuous all day. Sometimes I... I picked a bad day to go. Well, I didn't pick a bad day. Is the I, I can see why my boss Benny mm. asked asked for an extra pair of hands. Right. And I because yeah. because sometimes he asks for my help because the work is really hard, and sometimes he asks mm. for help just because just but just for the sake of time and efficiency. Yeah, yeah. You know, having an extra pair of hands can get like it, like if if there's a lot of work. But it's not so hard. Having an extra pair of hands can get the the large amount of work done quicker. Yeah, ideally, I mean, it's always a it, it's how much money it costs for the manpower versus yeah, how long it's going to take the job to do. It's just ideally because I can tell money. you that Saturday was like nothing I've ever worked before. Mm. N- nothing. Mm. <laughs> Got that? Because well. I prefer the longer the longer days, but doing less hard work compared to the shorter day but you're constantly burning everything in your system yeah it's good it's good like i've always thought that physical work is good for people i really i believe in it i think that everyone should do some form of it like you should always jump at the chance and if you can't do that physical exercise or going to the gym is as good as but like i feel like 
that physical work that you get through those jobs or or things like that or like working on houses stuff like that it's different it's more intense than like working on you know working out in the gym or doing sports it's it's somehow different but it's i think it's a lot more rewarding as well especially when you finish a project and you kind of remember like where it was when you began and and where you kind of arrived to when it ends and stuff and there's a sense of pride as well involved with that but i don't know i always felt really fulfilled when i worked on the farm i was in terms of how i felt physically it was very very rewarding but yeah fucking knackering <laughs> yeah absolutely hey ho hey ho um is there anything you kind of want to share with us uh, as we're drawing this all to a close and kind of settling down <laughs> um yeah uh to christian's viewers keep a good eye out because uh me and christian have a little project in the works in the form of mm -hmm. acting together social distancing acting it's called however you might not even be able to tell because of our dramatical expertise <laughs> no um <laughs> but the i i'm really i'm really proud of what this can be and i'm gonna do the recording well man sort of soonish yeah i'm not sure when chris uh, can get it up but it should be up pretty soon uh so look forward to that um what Absolutely. i wanted to say to you as, as as viewers as people um thank you so much for sort of giving smaller creators an opportunity to shine because just because we don't have 24 million subscribers doesn't mean you don't mean a lot because you do i mean you're the stepping stone to what our channels could become and if you want to start youtube feel free because it's free except it costs a bit of your manpower and it costs a bit of your time but at the end of the day it can be real, really really rewarding i mean i've already said that i've gained about 100 subscribers in three months but that's purely because of my hard work and it truly feels rewarding mm. so if you have a dream please follow it because you never know what it can become oh wise words thank you for sharing <laughs> totally agree with that no worry yeah uh thank you so much for appearing on this podcast i know it's a little bit different to what i normally do but i think we got, we got across what you do well didn't we i think we we did a good job all things considered especially since i didn't do any research which i kind of feel bad about but at the same time i felt like i knew enough about you that i would ask the right questions at least i, th I think i i don't feel like this you can always yeah, come been, back <laughs> we've been friends since i started up again I've, i mean we, we have been friends for about three months since i started i mean i met mm. you on twitter um uh, but yeah, yeah. at the same time as we sort of became friends from that as well so you sort of had a bit of an advantage i will say this all of my guests that appear on my show are always welcome back again and like the first time they appear is kind of an introductory thing it's like hey this is who this person is this is what they do go check them out go subscribe to them go follow them all of this stuff but once they come back i mean obviously you know it'll be about whether or not they have a particular thing they want to talk about maybe they just want to shoot the breeze and have fun stories maybe they want to promote a particular project whatever the case may be but like now that my audience knows you we don't have to do introductions again we can just jump straight into it you know or if there's stuff that was forgotten you're like hey hey what about this thing we can do that so there is that <laughs> yeah so i mean if you if you enjoyed me being here i mean uh, of course i am addressing christian's fans here if you do enjoy me as a guest and you do sort of enjoy my personality just ask and i'll come back and i'll do more because i'm more than happy to come back and help that's and very, sort of help you understand me a bit more it's very generous to think that i have fans but i i appreciate that <laughs> uh, i don't, I don't think we, trying to be nice i don't think we've quite got to that point but i guess we're talking to the people in the future in the future when i do have fans uh please heed dutch dill's words <laughs> no but in all seriousness man thank you so much for agreeing to appear on this man i really appreciate it i always have a lot of fun doing these interviews getting to know people a bit more you know i learned some new stuff about you that i didn't know or before so that's good uh, obviously it's a, a way it's of fun shooting. to be here yeah no and it's it's fun to have you man um you know i'm really 
enjoying doing these interviews. I think it's the favorite, my favorite thing about doing this podcast. I mean, you know, I have been doing a couple of episodes here and there um, where I don't have guests on, but I definitely prefer the ones with guests on. There's just something a little bit magical about about this. Um, but yeah, uh, if you want to appear on the Christian Reef podcast, get in touch with me. You know, you, you, you can find me pretty much everywhere on Instagram, on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch. God knows there's just so many places you can find me. So why haven't you found me yet? Discord. <laughs> Discord too, yes. I have a Discord server. Come contact me. Come be on the show. I would love to have a chat with you, to showcase your work, to promote you, to get to know you. You know, whatever you want to chat about, whatever you want to promote please feel free to get in touch. You're more than welcome to appear on the show. Thank, Big thanks again to Dutch Deals and to everyone watching on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, I bid you adieu.